Hi, everyone. This is Jung Rajiv from PhD Expertise. Today, we have a special guest, Professor Lisa Biswal from Rice University with us. So Professor Biswal is a professor in the chemical and biomolecular engineering. She joined the Rice University faculty in 2006. She received her undergraduate degree in chemical engineering at the Caltech. She then earned a doctoral degree in chemical engineering from Stanford University in 2004. And she completed her postdoc research in the mechanical engineering department at the University of California at Berkeley. She's a recipient of numerous awards. Just to highlight a few, she won a Young Investor Award from the Office of Naval Research in 2007 and the National Science Foundation Career Award in 2009. Glad you're with us today. Thank you very much. So I'm going to start with the first two questions. You complete your PhD in chemical engineering from Stanford University under the guidance of Professor Alice Guest. During this period, what were the primary areas of your research? I worked in the area of colloidal assembly with magnetic fields. And so I was taking uh, magnetic colloidal particles. So these are particles that are just around one micron in their size. And they're super paramagnetic, meaning that if you just had a solution of these particles, they would be able to, say, move around under Brownian motion. And if you then apply a magnetic field, they acquire dipole moments that cause them to align. And so once they're aligned into uh, structures, you can be able to actually chemically link them together. And so that's what I worked on uh, as my PhD. Great, great. Could you share any of your fond memory with uh, Professor Alice Guest? How was your experience oh, working with her? Oh, it was great. Uh, we had a, a really great group. Uh, so we had about, usually about five to six uh, students in, in her group at any given time. And it was really just like a family. Uh, so we got to really uh, grow together. We were working on different projects, but we really supported each other. Um, and uh, helped each other be able to uh, to advance kind of our science. You joined the Rice University faculty in 2006, and your group name is Engineering Soft Matter. Can you describe what that means and what type of work do you focus on now? Sure. So soft matter is really a nice way to uh, encompass matter that happens to be driven by thermal forces. So these are gonna be systems where they're what we call squishy, meaning that you can be able to think about bubbles and foams, colloids definitely falls under this uh, area, gels. Um, they all have these really interesting properties where they're not quite solid, they're not quite fluid, but they're in between. Uh, so that's where my group works in and being able to try and um, be able to build new materials, be able to come up with new solutions with this uh, building blocks of soft matter. Okay. And in your group, are there opportunities to do both experimental work and like some computational or do you partner with other teams to be able to do that as well? So both. So I definitely have a lot of work that is uh, experimental. And so I, I run a, an experimental, primary experimental group. But oftentimes with experiments, you're trying to understand why you see certain results. And so that's where simulations can come in and complement those experiments. And so I have um, actually as early as my very first PhD student, um, develop some simulations to help explain his experimental results. And so we do have uh, experiments and theory uh, coupled together. And so we use simulations to help explain a lot of our experimental results. And we will collaborate with groups, um, both other experimental groups, as well as computational groups to be able to advance our understanding of our materials. Okay. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And um, kind of in Getting into your research, you you published in the past on silicon coating for lithium batteries, um, and more recently you started working on new assembly methods to develop novel materials for batteries. So, what, could you talk a little bit about what new assembly methods means and the impact on lithium batteries? What's that connection? Our work with silicon really started now um, almost probably more than a decade ago. And it was uh, quite uh, by accident that we started working on it. We had been 
uh, looking at uh, structured surfaces and silicon being one of those, we were making it porous, making, making it rough. Um, and then I had met a collaborator who asked, well, have you thought about using these for um, lithium ion batteries? And I hadn't. And, um, but that got us uh, connected and we started then um, thinking about the idea of using porous silicon as an anode for lithium ion batteries. And so uh, I would take oftentimes silicon substrates and we would do uh, hydrofluoric etching with an electrochemical bias. And that makes then the silicon um, porous. So it then has a, kind of like a Swiss cheese type of structure to it. What's nice about this is silicon actually has a much higher capacity for lithium than our existing carbon-based materials like graphite. Actually, almost 10 times as much capacity. Uh, but the problem with silicon is that it swells significantly when it lithiates. And so that's why if we can be able to increase that surface area to volume ratio by creating these extra void spaces in the silicon, we can be able to accommodate some of the stresses that happen in the material as it swells. And then what we've done doing with assembly method is we've been making a composite. So we take the porous silicon and we actually uh, embed it in a conductive polymer. What the polymer does is it provides a nice binder material for the silicon and it helps again uh, accommodate some of the stresses in the material as it as it tries to uh, swell when it uh, alloys with lithium on there. Do you believe that, that that's a, there's potential for a longer term solution there as far as like the swelling, the volume expansion that happens or some of the yes. challenges that you're facing there? Yeah. Yes. So and these um, silicon is is starting to see um, its way into commercial batteries uh, now. And so there's a number of uh, battery manufacturers that are incorporating silicon nanoparticles into their anode formulations. I think for both Jung and I, one of the um, founders of Sila Nanotechnologies, he was on our thesis committee. And so he's a big proponent of silicon. And so that, that's that's awesome that you're thinking of different ways to be able to do that. Oh, and then, and then we did want to ask you, so we saw that you, the students that leave your group have been quite successful after they've, they've gotten a wide variety of opportunities. What do you, what do you look for in candidates when you're, when you're thinking about a candidate coming in to your group? No, that's a great question. And you're right. I'm very proud of uh, my students and where they have ended up. Uh, just talking about the batteries work, I've, I've had several students who've ended up um, in uh, battery companies and startup companies for advancing uh, materials for lithium ion batteries. So definitely uh, that's that's been a big area for us. So regarding your question about what I particularly look for in candidates and my philosophy for coaching. Um, I always assume that anyone who's coming in for a PhD is really here to be able to kind of expand their knowledge base, right? They've, they've chosen to come down a path of, of, of a doctorate um, because they're really looking to be able to really get that depth of knowledge to make advancements. And we're seeing this in a lot of industry now to be able to advance in the research and development that many of our industries are looking for. They want to have uh, folks who are really have that depth of knowledge and the, the critical thinking skills because going through a PhD, you really have to, you're going into the unknown. You're, you're working on things that there are no solutions for. And so you are having to really push that envelope and think of creatively about solutions for you know, a vast variety of problems that we have to tackle on there. And so I go in really having that, that idea that anyone who comes for a PhD has that kind of openness to be able to really go into a deep dive in knowledge um, and that is willing to be creative and really try and push the envelope on new solutions for problems. And, uh, and that's what, you know, I think also leads to success uh, for, for candidates. If they're really willing to be, you know, some say that 
oh, science doesn't have a lot of creativity. And I really counter that by saying that in reality, you have to be really creative to come up with solutions to some of the biggest problems we we have, whether that be in energy and health and you know, materials, climate, so on. It's really being able to not look at what's already been done, which we need that information, but then being able to take that and be able to then push the envelope for looking for new solutions on here. Last part of your question about my philosophy and coaching students is I always feel like I am the, the seed planter. So I um, will plant ideas. Um, I will be able to help kind of train and guide. Uh, and that's oftentimes happens very early in a student's career. And then I oftentimes see there's a switch where the student now is the one coming and telling me and educating me about the new discoveries they're making, why it's happening. It's great to be able to see that. So I really uh, try to take that philosophy where I'm really there as as the guide and there to nurture a student towards being an independent researcher. Right. Yeah, no. And that is, um, you know, that is kind of reflective of my experience as well during my PhD process where you kind of start off and there's a little bit more dependency on your advisor and you kind of ramp up and then you become the expert and you work together in tandem. So that, that's awesome. Um, and then kind of coming back full circle, to you. So now you are the Associate Dean for Faculty Development in the School of Engineering. Now, what are some of the areas of research that are ongoing, some exciting things that are happening in the school? No, so there are a number of interesting areas that we're working on within the School of Engineering. So we have nine departments uh, here at Rice within the School of Engineering, um, and they vary. They vary from statistics and computer science and electrical and computer engineering and bioengineering, chemical and biomolecular engineering, mechanical engineering, material science and nanoengineering, civil and environmental engineering, uh, computational applied math. I th hopefully I named them all, but, but there is, right, you can see just, you know, just me describing this, uh, just the vast array of topics that get covered within our school. But definitely there is what I kind of call big focus areas. So um, engineering and medicine is one of those. And so there's been big efforts in neuroengineering as well as being able to uh, design materials and advancements uh, for, uh, uh, for human health and advancements. Uh, there is uh, being able to make advancements in materials and material science. And so we have a department that's focused on that. But if you look, it's very interdisciplinary. So many of the departments within the School of Engineering are developing uh, materials for all sorts of interesting applications. Some of them um, range from being able to uh, uh, have stronger properties or be able to solve you know, problems related to energy or be able to clean up the environment. So there's just a broad range of topics that are being used for, for materials. Um, the other big area that uh, we're working on is in, um, in uh, energy, all right? And this is broad, right? We have, being in Houston, we are definitely the energy capital of the world, right? And Jung, you know, you're at Shell, and we uh, are hearing things like an energy transition, right? How do we move towards clean sources of energy and research has to be a part of that. And so definitely we have big efforts in being able to uh, look at uh, supporting the energy transition on there. Um, we have a lot of effort in uh, computational and this could be anything from hardware to software types of uh, research that's happening as well as um, in the area of uh, environment. And so this can be able to have applications in water and water treatment, 
as well as even the design of the next generation of cities. And so being able to think about um, how would you be able to create a resilient city? Again, being here in Houston, we know lots about uh, what it's like to suffer from um, hurricanes and uh, we're seeing uh, effects of climate and things like that. So if we were gonna design um, optimal cities to tackle future uh, needs, what would that look like? So we have a lot of uh, areas like that. So that is, you know, kind of a long answer to what's happening within, within the School of Engineering. Um, and my particular role is Associate Dean for Faculty Development really is to support our faculty and being able to advance and grow their research. So from junior faculty getting started with their programs, what are best practices to be able to uh, be successful as a junior faculty to a senior faculty who are trying to be able to start new collaborations, start to be able to build bigger programs, being able to support some of their efforts also there. Wow, yeah, so there are there's plenty of opportunity at Rice University in the engineering and science spaces for uh, for interested candidates. That that is that's absolutely awesome. We're we're out of time, but we want to thank you first, Professor Biswell, for your time. This has been a really informative conversation, and thank everyone for watching. And if you have any questions for Professor Biswell, please contact us at PhD Expertise Team at gmail.com, and we'll relay them to her for you. Uh, thank you, everyone. <laughs>